So today we start with the very exciting chapter subsection title, History of Anthropology, Mostly in North America. Something that none of you really wanted to know about at all. It has to be the most, truly the most boring subtitle you could possibly imagine for, for a work of this kind. And you really didn't want to know the history of anthropology, especially in North America. But I like to title this class something different, or I like to conceive of it as something as in the question of why anthropology? Like, why does it matter what anthropologists were doing out there during this history? Because it's really the history of North America and in some ways combined with the history of the world that we're talking about. We'll talk more about this about halfway through the course, maybe a little bit after fall break. Well, we'll break down exactly where a lot of these things happened, histories that have really not been told to most of us in our standard history classes, even of North America. So I usually call this Why Anthropology. But as I was reading your comments, I realized I needed to retitle it. It really should be called because there's a lot, there's a lot of weird stuff going on here. There's a lot of strange characters in this play box. You dig them out, and you know, a lot of them are still kind of around, maybe a little too much of them. As uh, I think Cass put it, it's a surprisingly self aware count of anthropology. I'm, you know, I mean, anthropologists are probably good at uh, self reflection, not as good as we should be, but maybe more than other disciplines. So, I'm not sure it, for an anthropologist, it might not be that surprising to do this little exercise, but it's nice to see them do it probably better than other anthropologists. So let's see, who should we start out with? Alex, who would we sh should we start out with here as being somebody that you were like, wait, what's going on here? Right, yeah, and I'm thinking about a person who kind of wrote about that and tried to understand that, that old uh, Lewis Henry Morgan, who is in, he kind of grew up not too far around from here. He's sort of, you know, Syracuse, Rochester area. Did some pretty good ethnographic research among the Iroquois. Um, actually, I shouldn't say pretty good, did, did good research. Uh, and he wasn't really academically trained. He more was kind of interested in, just kind of went out there and did his thing. Um, also wrote some, a really super interesting book on the, the beaver in North America and how there were 75 million beaver when the Europeans arrived that had totally reshaped the landscape. But we digress. The book we're talking about here has this book called Ancient Society on Researches in the Lines of Human Progress from Savagery Through Barbarism to Civilization. Yeah, some of you are grimacing a little bit here, and you should. Now, Lewis Henry Morgan didn't really invent these ideas. In some ways, he was just kind of reflecting them and refining them and putting them out there for the reading public. This was a big seller and a lot of people uh, read it and drew upon it and it kind of crystallized for a number of people what they thought about the world. It embodied what Muckle Gonzalez and Camp call, or we kind of know of now as a unilinear theory of cultural evolution. That is to say that everybody is on the same line, a one line theory, and they are progressing, human progress from savagery to barbarism to civilization. So this is what uh, Morgan was spelling out back in the day. I think this is, uh, I'm 
want to say eight. Yeah, I got it pretty right. 1877, this was published. Now, I like to kind of represent this as a, I think we can diagram it out as a kind of ascending line idea. So I said that this is a, a simplified view because as they said in, in Morgan's telling, it has like seven different stages and there's different kinds of ideas that people had, but this was a prevalent idea in Europe and in uh, parts of the US of, of certain social classes had about others out there in the late 19th century, around this time, 1877 is a good time. So now by the 19th century, we mean that time from 1800 to 1900 when we say that. Um, so the idea is that, that we have the us who are the civilized us. And uh, how did we get there? Well, we got through these stages and you could place everybody on this line from the savage or what some people started to call the primitive through the barbaric or the isolated and through to the civilized. What would you say about this heart? If you had to describe this in a one word or a few, how would you characterize this point of view? Huh? A bit too generalized. What else might we say about it? Kind of arrogant. Might as well go ahead, Cass. It's very Eurocentric and it's kind of racist. I, yeah, I mean, maybe even ramp up the kind of. It's pretty bad. It's pretty bad because, you know, you start putting people on this line and where they're going, you know, where do you think they're going to end up? So, yes. <clears throat> I mean, for the most part, I mean, it talks a little bit about that. It, you know, it was basically, um, he came up, th these stages had been around. It, it wasn't that he invented them. There had been people talking about these. If you look back at, say, Adam Smith and the, uh, the Wealth of Nations in 1776, he talks about these different. So, you know, they had, they had been around. Like I said, he kind of crystallized them and he put more of a, you know, as I said, it, it, he put more of a, a, of a technological aspect. So if people had pottery, they were at one stage. And, you know, basically looking at their technologies. Um, and, and people tried to sort them out along these lines. You know, you'd go into society and say, well, they, do they have a wheel? Okay, we're, we're getting there. You know, do they have this? Do they have that? And if they didn't, you know, it's this kind of idea of sorting sorting people onto the stages of uh of life i mean i i guess on the sense that it is kind of racist maybe i guess it, i would say about this that it is at least it is not as racist as some of the thought that developed that people were completely off the line and had no hopes of improving at all so that was another idea that people had which is that if you were out there like you couldn't you couldn't you couldn't go up anywhere you were just limited to that we'll talk about that later that came about with the idea uh was linked to um uh probably linked to ideas of uh, physical or biological evolution that certain people simply weren't capable they couldn't even get up to barbarism let alone civilization so i don't know is it more or less racist to think that way yeah, probably in practice it's equally equally uh it, it doesn't really matter which way you uh, put it i guess guess the other thing i will say is that this schema was a justification for things that were already going on right so it's not that people went out with this idea and like oh, okay let's now now we can we can uh, put per certain types of people into chains and sell them as enslaved people because of this idea. The idea came sort of after these relationships. And as Alex put it, the, 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 uh, the how to say, the genocide of indigenous Americans had already in some cases uh, taken place by the time that Lewis Henry Morgan and others were writing these books. All right. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. So, 
when anthropology comes along, again, at a time after a lot of these things had taken place. So we'd already had the, you know, the, the imperialism and colonialism of the Americas, uh, starting with the, the Spanish and the Portuguese and the British and French and the, and the Caribbean and North America. And so uh, when anthropology comes around, when people start really thinking about societies, it was after a lot of the colonialism had already taken place. So 1860s to 1920s is when we have uh, this kind of birth of anthropology. So the world had already been in some ways organized around this hierarchy in which certain peoples were placed at, a, uh, at, at different levels of civilization or uh, what they called progress. Um, that had already been established and was part of the idea framework for many people in uh, Europe and the US. And it's also, um, um, we've heard the word, the word has been introduced Eurocentric. Um, and so that will help us. It's also a hierarchy of what we call ethnocentric or ethnocentrism. So what, uh, what this means, and our textbook doesn't actually use this term until page 200, and I kind of wish they'd brought it up here. They do use the term cultural relativism, which we'll talk about later, which is kind of the counterpart to ethnocentrism. But uh, I'll just, ethnocentrism is the idea that our own customs are normal, while other customs are strange, wrong, or even disgusting. Ethnocentrism allows people to feel superior to others by denigrating differences in their behaviors, ideas, or values. So this is an ethnocentric approach saying that our way is the right way to do things and everybody else is either doing it wrong or hasn't been educated enough to be like us. So this is also the time when we have the academic disciplines that we know and love are really coming into place and consolidating, especially in uh, European and North American universities. So disciplines like sociology, economics, political science, are all starting to crystallize. And we're still taking classes in those today and they're known as the social and behavioral sciences. Um, and so anthropology emerges out of this mainly from places in the US, Canada, and uh, certain European countries, um, France, Britain being the, the larger centers. Um, and it's not as big as other economic, as other academic disciplines like sociology, economics, and political science. But basically, in some ways, because of the historical accident of this, anthropology gets assigned everybody outside of Europe and the United States. So the sociologists would mainly study in European and North American societies, French sociology. The economists would mainly study their own societies or societies that were considered to have an economy. Same thing with political science. All of those things were rooted in uh, the Eurocentric tradition and generally tended to draw from European thought. However, if you were an anthropologist, that's when you could study all these other people. And so for European and US anthropology, the question became under these cir circumstances, okay, wh what makes people different from each other? Here we have the us and we have the them and why are they like that? Why do they do the things they do? Why do we have this and they have that? What accounts for different languages? What accounts for uh, human difference? 
And the prevalent explanations at the time were either or a combination of racial determinism. So different people had different capacities or spoke different languages or did different dances or music because of some kind of biological feature. And so people would go around measuring people's heads and measuring people's tongues and measuring their kneecaps, everything to figure out if there was you know, significant biological differences which could be broken down among along racial lines and would be causal for how people did things and thought about the world. There was also the idea of environmental determinism. That is to say that, you know, if you live in a place where you can grow certain crops or have seasons, that you're going to develop particular forms of society. So if you have winter and you have to prepare for winter, then that will result in a different kind of society than if you are in the tropics. So again, and these things were kind of combined in various ways uh, to explain and justify uh, the, the differences that people saw. Now, conveniently, anthropology did physical anthropology, what we now call biological anthropology. So they were some of the people measuring heads and measuring bodies and doing all that stuff. So they were called upon to, you know, to account for so-called racial difference. And they also did archaeology or looking at material remains. So they'd be good people to turn to for environmental determinism as well, and technological determinism. How do we sort these people into categories? And so we, in some ways, we talked about the, the great thing that anthropology is holistic, right? That it combines all these things, you know, the uh, biological, the cultural, the, the, the material. And I was celebrating that on Wednesday, but in some ways it was because most Europeans and or many Europeans and many North Americans, the educated kinds, just assumed that people out there, other people didn't have economics. That they didn't have an economic system, they didn't have a political system, and they didn't have a history. And so anthropology just threw it all together as culture, or whatever anthropologist was studying. And I think, you know, I mean, I don't want to be too harsh on other disciplines, but I mean, I think to this day, if you take most political science courses and most economics courses and most sociology courses, you know, they're mostly going to be focused on um, European and U.S. societies. Not all. There are, uh, there are people who have branched out from there, but that's where they grew up and tended to do their work. And so it was assumed that other people didn't really have these things. And so anthropology kind of threw it all together. Now, one of the sort of key people, and we'll hear about this person later on as well, uh, is uh, an anthropologist, someone who's probably considered to be the founder of academic anthropology in the United States. A uh, immigrant from Germany, uh, Jewish in Germany, uh, experienced the anti-Semitism of, of Germany at that time and also in the United States, but comes to the United States and, uh, and really in some ways speaks against the anthropology that had developed around Lewis Henry Morgan. Um, he started his life as a as a physicist and had, or in, had studied physics and ended up in uh, in the Arctic, he kind of started out of his life as an environmental determinist. He thought that everybody in the Arctic region would see the world in the same way because of the harsh environment. But he discovered how different people were, even in the same area in the same uh, place that from 
village to village and from person to person, you couldn't make a generalization about the people there. So he gave up the idea of environmental determinism. And he would then be one of the most prominent people uh, in the United States to question the idea that there was a natural racial superiority or the idea that you were determined by your race. And uh, he actually did studies among people who were immigrating into the, uh, from basically from Eastern Europe uh, into the United States. And you now they'd go around and measure people's heads and bodies. And he made the amazing discovery that people's heads and bodies were changing within one generation of arrival to the United States. Even if they weren't marrying other people outside of their group, the environmental, the type of food they were eating, the type of housing they were living in, was changing their very body shape and body type. And so he said, well, how can this thing called race be something that we consider fixed if it's changing within one or two generations. People went nuts about this. They still do. I mean, people still get mad at him and say, no, that can't be, ah, that's the person who caused the downfall of blah, you know. Uh, he wasn't very well liked uh, among certain types of people because didn't want to hear it. So as I, we talked about before, Anthropology eventually says, no, human difference is not due to, I mean, obviously biology and genetics are important, but they don't determine your level of society or your accomplishments or what kind of language you speak. Obviously, the physical environment is important. You can't grow wheat and corn in the Arctic. Places where you can grow bananas are important places, places that you can have ship things across the ocean, etc. But it doesn't determine the kind of lifestyle or cultural ideas that people will have. Those patterns are learned. Those patterns are not determined by these things. They are influenced, of course, by them, but they are learned in our lives. And so what this enabled anthropology to do is to use this to speak out against that hierarchical ethnocentrism that we had witnessed and to say that, you know, no, other people were equally human and had things to say and things to learn from. Important, especially in that period of the United States from the 1860s and 1920s against the idea that people could be sorted into these racial groups and that they all were arranged along some sort of ladder from civilized to not. So anthropologists began to speak out against these ideas, began to get in some ways, uh, persecuted as well for them. And so, as opposed to the ethnocentrism that we talked about, uh, anthropology introduced the idea of cultural relativism, which we see on Michael Gonzalez and Camp on page 14, uh, quoting Matthew Engelke, cultural relativism is critical self-awareness that your own terms of analysis, understanding, and judgment are not universal and cannot be taken for granted. So the idea that we have to look around at the patterns of culture that other people have and not assume that our own are the only right, beautiful, true, God-given, natural way to live that other people might have a point to. Now, this is not the same as what is known as philosophical relativism. It doesn't mean we're going to say, ha, anything goes, everybody's right, do whatever you want. It's just a way of looking at the world 
that tries to be critical in the sense of understanding that there might be reasons for why people are doing the things they're doing and to try and understand those reasons from the inside. It doesn't mean we ultimately accept either what all people are doing or in our own society. In fact, we might use cultural relativism to understand because we need to change different things about our own society or even others. But as Ruth Benedict said, or people say she said, it's kind of a very famous quote in anthropology that she said in different places, not quite maybe, we haven't been able to find this exact quote, but it's pretty close to what she wrote at the end of Patterns of Culture and in some of her other writings, that the purpose of anthropology is to make the world safe for human differences. So at a time, and you can imagine in the 1920s and 1930s, when human differences were being, people were not making it safe for human differences, it was making, making it much more difficult to be different, uh, Benedict and others were considered their role as one in, as, as not just a study of, or an academic study, but as a position in society uh, to advocate for the full humanity of others uh, that might seem different from us. And so uh, anthropology in the United States, of course, there's still the Lewis Henry Morgan lineage and those ideas stick around. But for the most part, most academic anthropology gets traced to uh, Franz Boas and the people that uh, he educated. So, um, first PhDs and graduate studies in anthropology uh, known as Boazian anthropology. And Boaz was certainly out there in uh, fighting these ideas about racial determinism and also, of course, ethnocentrism. Um, some of the pe first people he trained as anthropologists, Ruth Benedict, who we just talked about, uh, and Margaret Mead, who had become one of the most famous, maybe the most famous an U.S. anthropologist ever. Um, and, you know, this is the 1920s and 1930s and 1940s when there were not a lot of women in the academy. And um, they were seen as full-fledged anthropologists in the anthropology circles. A lot of them were not able to get as good of university positions as they should have gotten. But in terms of who Boaz was training, he was training some, some people who were, who, were, who were not part of the academy at the time. He also worked uh, with uh, he, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, who uh, was a famous uh, famous person in the Harlem Renaissance, although her, when she actually passed away, she had been forgotten, has kind of was been in some ways uh, after she passed away, as so many authors do, got a lot, got fame again. Uh, may, you may have read at some point, their eyes are watching God or her very anthropologically influenced study, Mules and Men. Um, she was sent by Boaz into the south and into uh, to study the, uh, uh, the societies and the uh, cultures of African Americans. And uh, she never held a university position, but wrote some pretty famous and amazing books at the time. Uh, he also worked with indigenous uh, collaborators, Ella Cara Deloria, George Hunt. Uh, to try and train them to be to be good anthropologists. So um, he's kind of seen as a as a key figure, and we like a lot of the things that he did in anthropology. But I guess I would say uh, there were limits to Boazian anthropology, as much as uh, well. Let's. 
bring some other folks in. Ariana, what what were some of the limitations here? What what were some of the things that anthropologists were doing that were not so great? Yeah. So Boaz, you know, on in theoretical terms, he was advocating for indigenous cultures and indigenous societies. But he was also participating in what was called salvage ethnography. So the idea was, hey, these societies are disappearing or disappeared. We got to go in and get them before they disappear. So that includes information, but it also includes digging up people's bones. It also includes getting stuff and taking it out to museums. And if you go to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City and get to go there where they just I think they just took down that statue of Teddy Roosevelt out front. But if you go into the Great Hall, you can see that big quacky oodle canoe that Boaz brought in. Um, and, you know, there was uh, <laughs> the mistreatments were, it was more than just information. It was like putting people on display. Uh, it, it was serious, some serious bad stuff. And, you know, I don't know if Boaz always didn't really try to justify it. It was just what, what you were doing. Um, the other thing is that although anthropologists in general were speaking out against racial determinism and against ideas of race, they really didn't go all the way, you might say. And you might say, oh, well, they were just, oh, they were just, people of their time. But there were other people of their time who were serious anti-racist and who they talked to and they could have joined with, such as W.E.B. Du Bois, who did some amazing ethnographic work in Philadelphia and elsewhere, but was never really accepted as an anthropologist, sometimes more as a sociologist. But Boaz and Du Bois talked to each other, and Du Bois had Boaz give lectures, but he didn't embrace that, a, a more serious anti-racism which Du Bois espoused, or for that matter, Zora Neale Hurston, who, as I mentioned, never was accepted in the academy, was never able to teach. Uh, I don't think ever actually got a formal degree in anthropology, even though she had done a lot of work in anthropology. And so on the one hand, uh, there had sort of a limited scope. And as anthropology kind of settled into or tried to fight for academic positions, the kinds of people like me who would teach students and write in people who would write textbooks and try to have academic credit and all the climb the academic ladder. For the most part, anthropology sort of became the people who were the guardians of culture. So we said, okay, we're the people who can tell you about culture and we're the people who can tell you about other societies. What anthropologist uh, Michelle Rolf Trouillot, who I mentioned on Wednesday, called the savage slot, which is to say those people who were out there, uh, outside of the realm of uh, the European or the U.S. mainstream. And so there's a really interesting box that I'd, uh, that I'd draw your attention to on pages 24 and 25 of the uh, of the textbook called Anthropology, Popular Culture, and News Media. And in this box, we hear from anthropologist Hugh Gusterson about the ways that anthropology appears in the popular media or places like the New York Times. And what Gusterson says is anthropologists generally appear as, oh, they're the people who will tell you about the strangers or the, the savages or the primitives. 
and that anthropologists are called in when you need to, you need something on the fluffy what uh, Gusterson calls the fluffy bits. So if you want something serious, you'll talk to an economist or a political science. But if you want to know, I don't know why people wear funny sneakers, you talk to an anthropologist because they'll tell you something funny about culture or blankets or whatever. So uh, when anthropologists appear in the in in the media or in society, it's often seen as people who will tell you about stuff that happens out there. So the question is what to do, what to do about this situation? Because, you know, I think we, we know that um, anthropology could do things. Um, as Michael Gonzalez and Camp put it, Here's a discipline that has studied biology and material culture and archaeology and human diversity that does ideally include people across the world. And we know that as the world is interconnected, that we can't leave anybody out, as that will probably become come back to hurt us, that we're going to need the voices of people to understand what's going on with our main issues, climate change, food, sustainability, uh, even doing business and economics in different societies. And so certainly anthropology can contribute to understanding, but how, we have to, in some ways, break out of this stereotype that anthropology is only going to tell you about goofy little cultural stuff. Fluffy bits, the fluffy bits. So one of the things that uh, that Michael and Gonzalez and Camp say, which is, is that we need more diverse anthropologists. We need, need people who are actually from the communities that are most being affected. How are we doing on that, Christine? How would you say we're anthropology is doing? <laughs> Not good enough. Not fast enough. Right, I mean, did we really have to wait for, I think that's what, how you put it. Did we really have to wait for COVID-19, Black Lives Matter and Me Too, and then be like, oh yeah, us too. <laughs> Way too slow. What am I still doing standing here is what you're wondering. Yes, I do as well. We need, we need, we needed. Uh, and one of the problems was, is that when I was being trained in anthropology in the 1990s, um, you know, there was actually, uh, how to say, there was actually a whitening of anthropology during that time, if you can believe that, because in some ways people, it was, it was seen as something that you, you couldn't get much, you couldn't have a real career in it. And so when I came into anthropology, it was actually a field that was Growing whiter, and here I am, yay. <laughs> Not good. So it should have happened sooner, hopefully doing better now, but um, boy, oh boy. Yep, yep, so <laughs> still an issue. Um, recently, and this is drawing upon what, what indigenous people themselves have talked about is of increasing importance, um, the idea of decolonization. So not simply advocating for or speaking for, in fact, definitely not speaking for, but trying to um, actively, maybe we should, we should, uh, we should we should read the definition a little bit before I, before I get in trouble here. Decolonization, the goal of dismantling, this is on page 21, the historic and ongoing systemic oppression of indigenous peoples in the United States and Canada. And this has taken on dimensions across the world as well, but uh, it 
it really did in some ways. The Canadians were way out in front on this one, or uh, we might say uh, what uh, some, uh, the first, what Canadian, the first nations of Canada were way out in front on this one. So in, in our world, we sometimes refer, in the United States, we sometimes talk about Native Americans. Uh, some people more have started talking about indigenous peoples. Uh, in Canada, they began talking about them as First Nations, which is the idea that they were not only uh, there before uh, Euro European colonization, but had formed uh, things that things that were like nations before Europeans had arrived. So, uh, decolonization uh, in anthropology that's meant. Um, as uh, Jess, in your post, you talked about the museum stuff and where does that go? <laughs> do, we, do they just sell it to other museums, which would be bad? To an extent, uh, you know, again, this hasn't moved fast enough, but there has been what they call repatriation. So taking artifacts, looking at them, figuring out who they belong to in collaboration with indigenous peoples and then returning them to the groups from which they were extracted. Um, I think the Jaeger Museum downstairs uh, has been actually fairly on the forefront of, of that. Uh, had some pretty pretty good uh, good repatriation exercises in the last couple of years. Uh, so uh, kudos to them for doing starting that process. Um, it can be complicated, but um, but it's happening, and so uh, that's good. And then, I mean, it may sound like just a terminological change, but some of these things, the way we think about people, are is often linked to the words we use. So Delaney, you had a good example of a, a better way to talk about things. Uh, how, how might we talk about things that we used to call skeletal remains? Ancestors. So, yeah. It's a step in the right direction. It helps out. When there's skeletal remains, you can, you know, <laughs> small step. Well, I mean, think about it, though. Right. I have, you know, think about the difference in your mind between saying, oh, yes, we have recovered some skeletal remains. Here they are in this box. Or <laughs> we've recovered some ancestors. Oh, wait. They shouldn't really be in this box, should they? Right? I mean, it's like, you know, I don't know. I mean, we, I don't think that we want people's behavior to change, not just terminology, right? We want people to change what they do. We don't want to just use different words and keep doing the same shit, right? You want to do different stuff. But the words might help. It might help your mind and the way things that are described to do that. No, they should say that they are ancestors to the people. Yeah, I mean, in the text it says, you know, and again, that's also like you don't just choose your own name, right? So I to read using the preferred indigenous name for a given community, nation, or tribe. So that's one start. A lot of, I mean, there's a lot of the people who are named in this in the United States were named when explorer, European explorers would come in and they'd say, what do they call the people over there? And whoever was the enemy of the people who were over there would call them by some derogatory term and then they got named that. So that doesn't help us, right? So using the indigenous name rather than the anglicized name often imposed upon them and using terms preferred by indigenous peoples such as ancestors rather than skeletal remains. So. The terms we use also should be in consultation with the people who, who are affected uh, by these 
by these things. So getting there, not fast enough, need more, maybe someday, but um, all of these are super huge issues that we'll keep in mind as much as possible throughout the course, we'll be returning to them.